Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Guzik, and I'm so pleased that you could join me here on what is for me on the West Coast of the United States, a Thursday afternoon, right about noon. And what we're doing here is we get together for a weekly time whenever we're able to for a question and answer time where we will, um, we meaning I, I sit here, you submit your questions on the live chat. They get forwarded to me by a moderator and I do my best to answer them. Now, I need to apologize maybe just a little bit because last week I was unable to be with you all uh, because I was on a trip to the Middle East and went with three dear pastor friends, guys who serve in the leadership here of Enduring Word, uh, the ministry that I'm a part of. And we went together to Jordan and saw some things there. Two weeks ago today, uh, our live question and answer was from a hotel room near Petra because we we're going to visit Petra the next day. Uh, a week ago, we were in Saudi Arabia in a hotel room uh, at the right time for us to do this, but the internet connection was not nearly good enough, not even close to be able to give us a decent program. And so the better thing to do was just to say, well, we're not going to do it this particular week. Uh, let's move on and we'll consider something else at another time. Now, what I want to do is tell you, not only apologize for not being able to be with you here, it was a rare thing for us to have to cancel a Thursday question and answer. But look, from time to time, it's going to happen. It's really no big deal. But I do want to say this, that we are really um, excited. I'm really excited about sharing with you some of what we saw in Saudi Arabia and just kind of the general concept behind it. Um, now, I do want to say that the guys with me, uh, my dear friends, uh, Chuck Musselwhite, uh, Lance Ralston, Miles De Benedictus, Miles and Lance took a ton of video and we're going to produce a really good quality, comprehensive video about the things that we saw in Saudi Arabia relevant to Israel and the Exodus uh, back in the book of Exodus. And of course, in through the chapters, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then uh, Deuteronomy when they're on their way into the promised land. So what I want to talk to you about is why we were there at all and what kind of sparked our curiosity to go and do some research. Now, a few years ago, it was kind of a dangerous thing to visit Saudi Arabia and look at the things that we are going to look at. I don't want to exaggerate. It's not like it was high danger, but um, some of the locals might give you a hard time some of the officials, and then back 30, 35 years ago, some of the people who were investigating some of these things had a very difficult time. In the last couple of years, the Saudis have started granting tourist visas. And so there was nothing really dangerous about our trip, except maybe for the fact of some very difficult hikes up the mountain, the mountain that could be Mount Sinai. Very difficult hikes. Uh, other than that, there was no danger uh, we were welcomed by a local tour company. We worked with local Saudis. So there, there was nothing sketchy. We were a group of a total of about, uh, I don't know, 13, 14 people. And uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful time together. And I just kind of want to share with you some of the, the aspects, some of the idea behind this. And so uh, in able to do this, I kind of got to go and paint a little picture. And look, I'm going to try to do something a little bit new here with the uh, technology that we have. So let me first consider this. I, I want to show you some uh, slides, some PowerPoints having to do with just the general concept of what we were doing over there in Saudi Arabia relevant to Mount Sinai. Okay, so what you're looking at right here is the Sinai Peninsula and the Arabian Peninsula. And as you look at that, you can see that um, what we have listed there is, number one, Egypt over there. Uh, you have Canaan or Israel uh, up at the top there. And then you have two markers that I put down for you there, Mount Sinai Traditional and Mount Sinai in Arabia. The name of the mountain uh, in Saudi Arabia is Jabal Makal. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. I'm just doing the very best I can with that. But you, you see, that's the general layout, that there's two competing ideas there's a long established traditional place of Mount Sinai on the Sinai Peninsula. And then there's a place in Saudi Arabia, uh, Mount Sinai in Arabia, Jabal Makal. And what's kind of the idea between these two? 
Well, it has to do with where, number one, Israel crossed the Red Sea. It's a little bit complicated because in the book of Exodus, uh, the terminology isn't actually Red Sea. It's a sea of reeds. And in trying to identify exactly where this place is, it's a little bit of a challenge. The, the more normal composition places Israel's crossing of the Sea of Reeds, Yam Suf, what's called in the Bible the Red Sea, over a region called the Bitter Lakes in Egypt, and then down to Mount Sinai traditional. That's the traditional conception. But then there's another theory that says, no, where Israel really crossed the Red Sea is what is today the finger of the Red Sea that we call the Gulf of Aqaba at a place called Nuvaiba Beach. Now, again, th there's some people that say, no, it happened north of there. Some people say it happened south of there. I, I think the majority opinion and the place that we looked at the best was this place called uh, Nuvaiba Beach. And the idea is that Israel crossed over Yam Suf, Sea of Reeds, Red Sea there, and they went to Mount Sinai in Arabia. If you want kind of a look on this on Google Maps, the blue dot there represents the Saudi side of the crossing. You can see just to the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba there, uh, Nuvaiba Beach, and then you see the red marker for Jabal Makla. Uh, again, that's the place said to be Mount Sinai in Arabia. That gives you a little bit idea of the geography there. Now, when we went there, we saw across the water, this is uh, from the Saudi side, looking over the eight mile stretch between the Saudi side and the Egyptian side over the Gulf of Aqaba. And there is something of what you might call a land bridge underneath there. In that particular place, for some width, there is not as deep uh, a channel there in the Gulf of Aqaba, which normally is very deep. So the idea would be that at that sort of creased place that you see on Nuvaiba Beach over on the Egyptian side, God would have miraculously parted the waters. Israel comes over to the Saudi side and eventually makes their way to Mount Sinai, Jabal Makla there in uh, Saudi Arabia. And that's what the mountain looked like. That's what we saw there. Curious to this mountain is the burned top of the mountain. Now, it has the appearance of being burned. I'm not a geologist, although one in our group, Lance Ralston, has a lot of uh, background in geology. He's not a professionally trained geologist, but he's done a lot of uh, research and uh, he's taken a lot of classes in college about it. And he, he was really um, helping us understand. And he remarked himself at the unusual nature of these blackened rocks at the top. Uh, again, there's not enough to say that it, there's a miraculous explanation, but there is an unusual blackened character to the exterior of these rocks on the top of this particular mountain. And of course, we know from the book of Genesis that a fire burned on the top of Mount Sinai. Now, that's looking, of course, from the ground up to Jabal Makla, uh, which would be Mount Sinai in Arabia. Um, this would be looking from about, oh, a third of the way up down. That area that you see down below there, I, I would consider to be um, the place where the tabernacle would have stood, if, if this is indeed uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, again, there, there's some debate about it. I don't want to act as if the debate's finished. But, but if that were the case, that area you see right there below uh, would have been the place where the tabernacle was set up and the altar of sacrifice. There's uh, ancient ash deposits there and, uh, and uh, evidence that animals were corralled there in ancient times. And there's also some uh, discussion about there being pillars there marking the place. A and then if you were to continue on with that, this is a slide further up the mountain looking down at this vast area where Israel could have camped uh, around at the foot of Mount Sinai. So this is up at the really the summit where we were. And I got to say, it was a very stirring sight. Very difficult climb, if I could say, uh, with that trip. I anyway, they they uh, you could see this vast area where Israel could camp. Even if they were numbered in the millions, there was adequate room there for them to camp at the base of Mount Sinai. And then one other thing to show you, this is, uh, or a couple other things. This is the view of Jabal Makla. It, it's kind of right there in the middle 
uh, from that camp area, looking out upward to it. And so if Israel camped there, that's what they would have seen up in the distance. That sort of middle peak there would have been Mount Sinai, or actually just to the left of the middle as I'm looking out on it. And then one other final thing that we saw that was pretty significant. And again, all this is going to be presented with much greater detail in a much greater way in a video that we hope to have in coming weeks. We're not going to try to hurry this thing, but eventually it'll come out. And I think it'll be of great interest to you. Uh, and then is this rock, Rephidim is what they call it. This place where uh, Moses spoke to the rock, it was split or struck the rock, I should say. It was split and water flowed out from it. What's really interesting is not only the very striking character of this huge rock, very tall. Um, I mean, 70, 80, 100 feet tall. Um, we don't have a person next to this to get a sense of scale, but it's a very tall rock up there. Not only is it very demonstrable in its split character, but there's the marks of sort of a radical erosion event down at the bottom and the base of this which is, again, really striking in its character. So there's a lot to be said about all that and the um, whole nature of this uh, very, very interesting sort of scene that you have there in Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, if I were to kind of um, give you my view on why... Let me cut this out because it looks very strange, of course, to see me twice here. Um, excuse me... Okay, I can turn that off. What really looks interesting and strange is when you sort of put the case together, you kind of get the feeling uh, that there's really something to be made for this Mount Sinai in Arabia viewpoint. Let me just go over very quickly the, the, the six things that I think are significant points. And again, I want to emphasize, I don't regard the issue as settled. I would want to do more research into seeing the strength of the Mount Sinai, the traditional Mount Sinai case. But again, uh, what you have for the Arabian alternative, I would say, would be these points. Uh, first of all, you have the very straightforward mention in Galatians chapter 4, verse 25. Um, Paul calls Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai in Arabia. And the most straightforward meaning of that would be, well, in Arabia. So I think that's a very sort of direct and compelling thing. Then you have the whole geography of the Red Sea crossing. Uh, part of the thought of this is that uh, in that area that I showed you in one of the previous slides, up at the Bitter Lakes, there just isn't the, um, how would you say, there, there isn't really the, um, the geography for Israel to be hemmed in by the mountains and against the sea with no way of escape at the Bitter Lakes, or at least not one that's easily seen. Whereas at that Nueva Beach area, it's very clear how Israel would be trapped by the Egyptian army and have no way of escape other than across the sea. So the geography of the Red Sea crossing, I think, is another thing that enters into that. A third thing, and I found this point very compelling. It's a simple idea of the location of Midian. Friends, I mean, I had read this. It's in my commentary, but I hadn't really understood it. You know, some, sometimes you read and you, you, you could talk about, but you don't really comprehend it. Friends, Midian is in Saudi Arabia. And we know that Jethro, Moses's father-in-law, was a priest of Midian. And Moses was tending the flocks of his father-in-law when he first went to Mount Sinai and saw the burning bush. Friends, the location of Midian in Saudi Arabia, or the Saudi side of the Gulf of Aqaba, really is very persuasive for that being the side where Mount Sinai is. Um, th there's really kind of no other explanation for that thing. I think it's a very persuasive point. Th there's just no doubt archaeologically or linguistically or these things. Midian is on the Saudi side of the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, then a fourth point you would have is the idea of the suitability for the camp of Israel. Look, friends, I, I visited the Arabian alternative Mount Sinai. I haven't visited Mount Sinai on the Egyptian peninsula there. Uh, but what I've heard is that there's not the same suitability for a large area for Israel to camp at the base of Mount Sinai in uh, the Sinai Peninsula. 
Uh, there's also the factor of local names and traditions, including the wadi that leads up to Mount Sinai. The, the locals call it the wadi of Moses. And uh, the, the high regard for Moses and the local legends and traditions make a difference. And, and then just one last thing I would give the idea of this idea of Rephidim and the erosion patterns that were seen there at Rephidim. So I, I think that there's a pretty strong case to be made for what I would call the Arabian alternative. Again, I would want to stress that uh, I don't think it's a closed um, uh, issue. Uh, I kind of would want to do more research on my own, but I have to tell you, it was an absolutely fascinating trip to go there. And uh, because of that trip, we weren't able to be with you all last Thursday, but it's sure good to be back. In just a moment, I'm going to get to your questions forwarded to me on the live chat. But first, I have something very important to do. I have a first question to answer. Uh, that didn't come in uh, by the live chat. It didn't come in by email. Uh, it didn't come in on social media. It came on in the best kind of media. A question from my granddaughter, uh, David Guzik. She writes my name. Question about God from Serena, my granddaughter. And uh, so she writes out this question. It's wonderful here. She put a little rainbow there at the bottom. Remembering, she says that she loves me. Love you there at the bottom. See, I can prove it there. Um, she says, read this out loud. And she points down here. When we are in heaven, hi, Serena, I hope you're watching. When we are in heaven, are we able to see what is happening on earth? Serena, that is a very good question. And it's a question that actually several people here have um, on the Q&A have asked from time to time. So um, I'm happy to try to give you the best answer I can to that. But Serena, I want to say a little bit, I'm a little bit sad because the Bible doesn't exactly tell us whether or not the people in heaven can see what happens on earth. We have a little bit of an idea that they can there's a verse in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament that talks about those people who have gone on to heaven being like a stadium full of people who are cheering on believers today. And believers today are like athletes on the field. They're, they're doing their work the very best they can. They're running the race. They're fighting the fight while the people in the crowds cheer them on. And maybe that suggests that people in heaven can see what happens on earth. But I have to say there's a little bit of a problem with that idea. Here's the problem with the idea is we know that there's no sadness in heaven. Nobody's sad in heaven. The Bible says that every tear is wiped away and all sorrow is gone in heaven. And in the way we often think is, if people in heaven could see what happens on earth, wouldn't it make them sad sometimes? Well, the only way I can think about this is to say that this, if people in heaven can see what happens on earth, then they will have such faith, such peace, such rest in the power and in the wisdom of God that they uh, will not be disturbed or troubled or sorry by it at all. So it may very well be that people in heaven have some knowledge of what's going on in the earth, but if they do, it doesn't make them sad at all because of how greatly they know God and how good God is and how powerful God is in everything that he does. Serena, thank you for your question. And I just want all of our readers to know, all of our viewers to know that, um, yes, absolutely, my grandchildren get priority on any questions on the Q&A. All right, let's go on here now. Let me click over a few places and see the questions that have come in on the live chat. Here we go. Uh, v asks, 
were you able to see the petroglyphs in the area showing the worship of the golden calf? V, yes, I was, our group was. They're very easily seen. They're very evident. There's an area not far from Mount Sinai. It's at the foot of Mount Sinai in Arabia. Uh, J- Jabal Makla, again, if that is the site. I, everything I say has that provision to it, if this is the site. Not far from there, there's a very distinct group of rocks that has impressive ancient petroglyphs on it of cattle, calves, and and some people. Petroglyphs are kind of these ancient stick figure-like things. And what's very interesting about that V is that uh, the people of that area, for as long as anybody can remember, that they don't have cattle. They just don't. We saw a lot of goats, uh, maybe a few sheep here and there, mostly goats. We saw some donkeys. We saw lots of camels. But what they don't have is cattle. And the idea is simply this, and V, this is what you're pointing to. Why would there be this distinctive uh, area of rocks? Uh, It's not very high. You can climb on it easily. And there's many petroglyphs of cattle all around it. But at the same time, the locals in that area don't and haven't for a long, long time had cattle. And the idea is, is that it's a memory of associating that place with the golden calf. And they're very, very, they're very well, maybe something to that. So V, yes, we could see those petroglyphs. It was very striking there. They call that place uh, the golden calf altar. Who knows? It could have been, but it, it is just very interesting and significant, the connection with that there. Okay, uh, let me go on to the next question from Yvette. Yvette asks, Hello from SD. Uh, I don't know if that's San Diego or South Dakota, but either way, Yvette. Um, Pastor David, are deliverance ministries biblical? I have seen videos of people saying to pray to be delivered from evil spirits. Well, Yvette, let let me kind of give you a, a quick answer and then a longer explanation. When I hear deliverance ministry, most of the time, I think that it's misguided at best and uh, foolish and harmful oftentimes beyond that. There is a tendency uh, among some people to to believe that Christians can be demon-possessed and all sorts of issues in their life can be blamed on demonic possession. And the idea that that the key to Christian growth is to cast a demon out of somebody. Uh, For example, there was a uh, flamboyant television preacher. I don't know if he's still around. Ernest Angley was his name. And uh, Ernest Angley, sometimes we would turn on his program just kind of for jokes. He would walk around in this powder blue tuxedo and with a lot of theatrics, cast demons out of people. And he was very famous for casting nicotine spirits out of people. And the idea with Ernest Angley was the reason why, Christian, you smoke is because you have a nicotine spirit in you, not because you're having trouble subduing the flesh from the very difficult addiction that people have to nicotine. So it's easy for people to sort of shortcut a sanctification process and think that things can be done by casting out demons. Most the time, that's what people mean in the Christian world when they use the term deliverance ministry. Now, Yvette, I do need to add this, though. On the other hand, we need to be aware of the way that Satan can have determined, stubborn strategies against believers. And I think it's very easy for Christians to minimize or fail to appreciate the level at which their problem may not only be a problem with the flesh, 
but that there is, I don't know the best word for this. Forgive me if my terminology isn't all the best, but what I most call a, a stubborn demonic spirit that keeps whispering or shouting lies to them. They're not possessed by that spirit, but that spirit is very stubborn and, and, and wants to lie to them continually. And these lies do a lot of damage when they are believed and not recognized. So I want to um, be sympathetic to Christians who believe in proactive spiritual warfare and, and will uh, help other believers to do what we read about in the book of James, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I, I think that, that there's great room for that and we can underestimate the power of the devil's lies. But most the time in the Christian world today, uh, when that terminology is used of a deliverance ministry, it's talking about something significantly beyond that idea that um, Christians need to contend with lying spirits and the damage that they do. So I hope that's helpful for you there, uh, Yvette. I'm going to go on to the next question from Chris. Uh, Chris asks, can Christians today claim promises from the Old Testament like Jeremiah 29.11 which was to the Israelites during the Babylonian exile and the other Old Testament promises. All right, Chris, thank you for this question. I love answering this question. Okay, Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, Chris, you point out very well, in context, that's a promise that God made to ancient Israel. He didn't make it to believers today. But it's a plan, it's a promise that God made to ancient Israel while they were in the Babylonian captivity. God saying, I'm going to, I've got a good future for you. Even though you are in exile now in Babylon, trust me, believe me, I've got a good future for you. Okay, we recognize that. However, Chris, follow me with this. The same God who made that promise to ancient Israel is the same God who reigns over believers today. Isn't that something important and precious for us to latch on to, to believe? So believers today aren't in the ex they, those were not the ones to whom this promise was originally spoken, but the same God that spoke the promise rules and reigns over the life. That's one principle. It's the same God. Secondly, Chris, and, and this is why I love talking about this. Are we to think that God is going to be more generous under the old covenant than he is under the new covenant? So while this promise was not originally specifically made to Gentiles or believers or, or whatever you would say. In principle, a believer could come to God and say this, Lord God, I know that you are the same God today that made this generous promise to Israel when they were in the Babylonian exile. And God, I believe that we have better promises under the new covenant than we than you even gave to people under the old covenant. Therefore, Lord, I stand on this promise and I agree that you have, as Jeremiah 29, 11 says, you have plans for my life. You want to bless me and not to harm me. You want me to have a hope and a future. I think that's an entirely legitimate prayer to pray not because God spoke that originally to the believer today, but the same God who spoke it reigns and rules over the believer's life today. And we have an even better covenant in Jesus Christ. All right. Hope that's helpful for you, Chris. Let me go on to a further question here. Looking up further question. All right. I'm waiting for a question. So let's see here. Um, 
Bull P K W J T W. Don't know what all those initials mean. It says, I came across the term covenant of works in a Bible study recently. When I try to research it, it seems to be discussed in reformed literature or not. What is this covenant? What is this term? Is it a biblical covenant? PKW, JTW, you're, you're speaking on something that is actually of great interest to me and that I've been doing some research on. Hold on for a minute while I look around for a book. Um, do I have this book anywhere near me? Uh, I don't see it. It's a book I was recently reading. Um, because look, what, what you're talking about, uh, again, um, PKW, JTW, what you're talking about is the reformed idea of covenant theology. And there's a lot to covenant theology. I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. But a basic component of covenant theology, to my understanding, is that all humanity relates to God on the basis of two covenants. There's either the covenant of works, that's what God established with Adam and supposedly Eve in the Garden of Eden. And then there's the covenant of grace. Um, that's what God brought in after the fall. Covenant of works, covenant of grace. And these two covenants sort of reign and rule over everything in the world. PKW, JTW, I think that this is a misguided way to understand God's working in his great plan of the ages. Mostly because the terminology covenant of works, covenant of grace, is really not found in the Bible at all. Uh, again, from the reading I've done, from the lectures I've listened to, I listened to a whole seminary series of uh, class on covenant theology to try to get my head around this. And, and, and to the best of my understanding, as I heard them speak and explain it, the, the, the scriptures just don't use this terminology. Now, listen, I believe very strongly in the idea of God dealing with humanity on the basis of covenants. But I believe that if if there's these all overwhelmingly important covenants, the covenant of works so, so important in Reformed theology, the covenant of grace so, so important in Reformed theology, then why could it, doesn't God use that terminology? It's not like God is short for words when it comes to describing covenants. God describes the covenant that he made with Noah, the covenant he made with Abraham, the covenant he made with Israel, the covenant he made with David, and most gloriously, the new covenant. From my estimation, and I have to say, I feel a little bit cheeky even saying this, because there's some very educated, very esteemed people who believe and advance these ideas. But if I'm allowed to be a little bit cheeky, I think that the whole terminology of covenant theology and the whole reform system of covenant theology is covenant confusion. And it has great relevance to why many in the Reformed tradition, most, as a matter of fact, believe in infant baptism. It goes back to their confused understanding of explanation of covenant theology. So PKW, JTW, this formal covenant of works, it's not in the Bible. If it was, God would have detailed it. This formal and all essential covenant of grace, it's not in the Bible. God has covenant terminology at his disposal, and he chose not to use it in regard to what the Reformed camp believes in their systematic theology is um, the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Look, there's sort of a huge dividing line in Christian theology. And it's those who put an emphasis on biblical theology and those who put an emphasis on systematic theology. 
Now, friends, I, I believe, of course, that there's a good place for systematic theology, and it's important, and it should be understood, and it's something to, to, to go through and, and, and make the best understanding of. But, but I, I am, first and foremost, an emphasis on biblical theology. And, and I don't like um, uh, an overemphasis on systematic theology concepts and ideas that are not clearly stated in the scriptures. And I think that the whole reform system of covenant theology is an example of that. So, um, friends, that's how I see it. And I thank you for that question, PKWJTW. Let me go on to the next question here from Carrie, who asks, Job shows that Satan has to get permission to interfere with Christians. Does the same apply to non-believers? Also, in the tribulation period, will Satan be free to do what he wants without consulting God? Well, Carrie, let me just explain it to you this way. Whether it's with believers or those who are not yet believers, Satan can't do anything except at God's allowance. We should never think that Satan is just some sort of renegade out there doing his own thing uh, without God's allowance. Anything that Satan is able to do, it's because God has allowed him to do it. God may allow him to do it in judgment. God may allow him to do it in uh, chastening. God may allow him to do it to bring forth something good out of what outwardly seems evil and to show the glory of redemption, God's ability to take all things and make them work together for good for those who love God and are the called according to his people. A purpose, I should say, as Romans chapter 8 says. So we need to get away from the idea that, that Satan can do his own thing. However, let me say, that I'm okay with the idea that when it comes to those who do not yet believe, those who are not born again by God's Spirit, they aren't sons and daughters of God by adoption, as the Bible says, that they have more latitude, excuse me, Satan has more latitude from God in dealing with them. Uh, and, and so th that's kind of how I, I, I would understand it. Very definitely, Satan has a greater latitude in dealing with people who are not yet born again. However, um, we shouldn't think that he's his own independent actor doing what he pleases without God's allowance. I, I guess that's the best way I would explain it. Definitely more latitude with those who are not born again, those who are not sons and God, daughters of God by adoption, but not unlimited latitude. Hope that helps you there. Uh, next question comes from Thierry, who asks, Dear Pastor David, my question is, will the church pass through the Great Tribulation? I've been searching for a verse about the rapture in the Bible, but never found a specific verse regarding this exact quotation. Okay, Thierry, I, I would say yes, I believe, and I do want to acknowledge that this is an area that is of great controversy uh, among people who study this. You'll get into some real battles between Christians who believe for uh, just all different things about how the end of days is going to work out in the Christian scheme. Listen, if you're a Christian, you must believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. However, even among Christians there can be a fair amount of debate as to how the Bible describes these events of the last days all coming together. Now, look, I, I have a way that I, I approach the scriptures and it makes sense to me, uh, but I, I want to be respectful to those who kind of uh, understand it in different perspectives. I, I don't think they're right. Obviously, I think I'm right. Well, why would I hold to a belief that I knew was wrong? It just makes no sense. Uh, however, I, I do want to be respectful knowing that uh, in some regard, these things of the future won't be fully understood until they're fulfilled. Okay, 
with saying that, what what passages of Scripture have to do with the church not being here during this period that some people call the Great Tribulation? And Thierry, I, I would say my, my basic approach is this. For me, the strongest argument for that is the basic biblical principle that the Bible does not contradict itself. So, in the Bible, you find different scenarios surrounding the second coming of Jesus. There's some passages of Scripture that say that Jesus will return in a completely unexpected way and the world will be carrying on quite normally. There's other passages of Scripture that say that Jesus will come back to a world in the midst of unbelievable crisis and catastrophe. Well, which is it? I believe that there's two different aspects of the coming of Jesus separated by appreciable time. A catching away of the church described in Thessalonians, and then on the other hand, a glorious second coming. I believe that has to do with the conditions of the world, the predictability of the date involved, uh, with the posture of the people of God, with the position of Jesus as he receives these people. I think that these are passages where the scriptures speak differently about them, and the best way to reconcile them is to see that there are two distinct aspects to the second coming of Jesus, each separated by a, uh, uh, an appreciable period of time. That's the way that it makes the most sense for me. Uh, this idea of the catching away of the church is described very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, but as for how it happens, there is no one specific verse one way or another that speaks directly to that, or, or at least no one specific verse that isn't um, held in controversy by those who would argue differently. Hope that helps you there, Thierry. Davey asks, did you see charred mountaintop? David, I certainly did. Now, it appeared to be a charred mountaintop. Look, I'm not trying to go up there and say I was a scientist. We did all these, you know, tests and stuff. But on Jabal Makal or Makla, this this uh, mountain that is said to be Mount Sinai in Arabia, there's a very definite, and we know because we went up to the summit, you pass from the area where the rocks are not charred or appear to be charred to the place where they are. And um, it's a very interesting kind of uh, surface on the surface of those rocks that appear to be charred. So yes, Davy, we very definitely saw it. Deb asked this question, is there any coordinated effort to look for the ark, Noah's, or do you think it's good that we don't know where it is? Well, Deb, it's interesting that you ask that because the man who led and organized our tour, a man named Andrew Jones, Andrew Jones uh, not only has an interest in the relevant information about the possible site of Mount Sinai in Arabia, but Andrew Jones also has a huge interest in the area of Turkey where Noah's Ark is supposed to be. And actually, uh, he spends about half his time in Turkey and half his time over in either Saudi Arabia or Egypt, uh, having to do with the Exodus. And so um, there is a very coordinated effort to look for the ark. And um, I think it would be marvelous if uh, greater evidence for the ark was discovered. Uh, most people are unaware that throughout history, there has been remarkable testimony to both a global flood and the existence of a large human-made wooden structure up high, high up on Mount Ararat in that general area. And this is a consistent thing, not just in the last few years where people got all excited about it, but for centuries back, uh, there's been people talking about these things. Uh, you can look this up in my Bible commentary. Start at uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 6. Uh, just breeze through the next few chapters and you'll see a section where I speak about the remarkable historical evidence there is, not only for a global flood, but also for uh, the existence of uh, Noah's Ark. And uh, I believe that it would not be a surprise if now, towards the end of the age, that God allowed it to be discovered as a testimony to mankind. Thank you for that question there, Deb. Uh, Saraja asks, 
Hello, Pastor. God bless you for your work. Do you mind speaking on the tragedy of the school shooting in terms of could God have stopped it? Saraja so is referring to just yesterday, maybe it was the day before. Uh, there was a terrible crime perpetrated uh, by somebody who took uh, guns, firearms, uh, into a, a Christian school. Um, if I remember correctly, they killed three children and three adults. It was a terrible crime that that person is going to have to face God for and will be judged for all eternity for such a dark crime as that. Saraja, you're asking, could God have stopped it? Saraja, yes. God, God could have stopped it. I mean, of course. God can do anything. If we're just talking about the, the, the theoretical, could God have stopped that person? Yes. God could have given them a heart attack on the way to the school. God could have made their car break down. God could have made their guns jam. But here's the thing, Sraja. God has put us in a world full of meaning. What we do has meaning. Think of what it would be like if God created a world where evil was impossible to do. Well, then we wouldn't live in a world where any choice was meaningful, where any action was meaningful. The mere fact that God put us in a world where not only is good a capability, but so is evil, means that we live in a world full of meaning. Every action a human being takes has meaning. And in some way, every action reverberates to eternity. Now, in such extreme crimes as this, it's very easy to see the, the unbelievable wickedness of it, the, the demonic, murderous aspect of it all. But it would be even worse to live in a world where evil was impossible and our actions, our intentions, our, our whole lives, you could say, really were empty of meaning because evil was impossible. Sadra, this is not the best possible world. God has not put us in the best possible world. Not right now. What God has done is this, is he's put us on the best possible path to the best possible world. The best possible world where evil will no longer be allowed. That's a world to come in the world beyond. It's not right now. And uh, for that, believers need to be vigilant. Uh, law enforcement needs to do their job to be God's instruments, the very best of their ability to hold back evil and to punish evil when it happens. And so we, we are left that God has given us a world full of meaning. That's a great burden for humanity to bear. And we don't always bear it well, do we? All right, go on to the next question from Tommy, who asks, I'm worried my friends won't make it to heaven. I'm praying for this to not happen since it is God's will that none will perish. Am I guaranteed that they will be saved in Jesus' name? Well, Tommy, not, not really. When we read in Peter that it's God's will that none perish but all come to salvation, that is definitely God's will in expressing the intention of his heart. But it's not what God will actually carry out and do. Again, for much the same reason that I just answered the previous question, because God wants lives to have meaning. Meaning for good or meaning for evil. And God will judge the evil. So while God's disposition of heart is for people, that they would come to faith, that they would come to repentance, there's no doubt about that. 
God has given us a world where people, if they are determined to reject God's provision in Jesus Christ, God will honor that choice. Now, I, I want you to understand this, uh, Tommy. You're right. You're doing the right thing in praying for your friends. Of course, if you have the opportunity to speak a good word to them, God opens up a door and you can share with them the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that uh, we can come into right relationship with God, not by working hard to be better people, but to receive what Jesus Christ did for us, especially in his work at the cross and in his resurrection. At the cross where he bore our sins as a substitutionary sacrifice and in his resurrection where he triumphed over sin and death. Our relationship with Jesus, with trusting love, where we trust in him, rely on him and cling to him, that brings us into a relationship where the perfect righteousness of Jesus is credited to us and our sin is credited to him and he bore it perfectly as God's perfect sacrifice. If you have the chance to share that gospel of good news, well, then by all means do it. But even if you don't have that opportunity, you can pray. It's been said, and I think it was maybe E.M. Bounds who said this, maybe it was A.W. Tozer, that, um, well, I'll paraphrase. If you only had the choice between speaking to men about God, in other words, evangelism, or speaking to God about men, that evangelism would be more effective speaking to God about men, praying for them. And there's something to that. So don't be discouraged in prayer, Tommy. Keep praying for your friends who don't yet know Jesus Christ. Raquel asks, since God is a triune, slash a trinity, we worship God the Father and the Son, is it appropriate to worship the Holy Spirit directly also? Referring Acts, stating that the Holy Ghost is also God. Thank you. Raquel, I would say that it's fine providing that it doesn't become an emphasis. Look, Raquel, you're completely correct. The Holy Spirit is God. And as God, he deserves worship. He deserves honor. He deserves glory. However, Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, he will not speak of himself, but he will testify of me. And that gives us something of the, the role of the Holy Spirit in the Godhead. It's not to draw attention to himself, uh, but to draw attention to Jesus Christ, who in turn points to God the Father. So I think if somebody became sort of obsessed in a strange way with focusing on praying to the Holy Spirit, worshiping the Holy Spirit, sort of to the exclusion of prayer or worship to God the Father or God the Son, that would be strange. But we don't feel like we need to ignore our worship, our communication to God the Father excuse me, to God, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, next one from Gabriel says, uh, why don't people raised from the dead like Lazarus, Tabitha, or Dorcas, why don't they mention anything about the afterlife as in near-death experiences and visions? Well, Gabriel, I, I can't really tell you why. You're right in observing that they don't, but the Bible doesn't really tell us why. Let me suggest to you an answer. Uh, it's because God wanted us to hear about the afterlife from Jesus himself and from the word of God itself. Um, the, the Bible says in 1 Timothy, I believe it is, that Jesus Christ has brought light and immortality to light through the gospel. And that's what Jesus does. He brings life and immortality to light. Uh, I think it's easy uh, if we had a lot of biblical testimonies to afterlife experiences, that it would make us focus on people who claim afterlife experiences today. 
uh, most of which I haven't done an exhaustive study of this, but most of these claims to afterlife experiences, uh, you know, these fanciful visions of heaven and this and that, um, a lot of them are, are bogus. Uh, so I think God wants us to have our attention on Jesus more than anything else. I, I would just suggest that as a reason. Okay, lightning round. And I take it that we're going to conclude with this lightning round because my voice is getting a little bit tired here. Um, Raquel. Uh, no, wait. Um here we go. Lightning round. Uh, Pittasoni asks, is there any biblical ground to give hope of righteousness to Christians that remarried while their previous spouses were still alive? Pittasoni, yes. Even if a person sinned by an ungodly divorce and remarriage, that sin can be forgiven. They need to repent and confess. And the problem comes when people think that the only way to repent of that sin is to divorce your present spouse. Friends, that's piling sin upon sin. I've got a whole video dealing with this. Look it up on our YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's divorce, marriage, and remarriage. Just look it up. Just search our YouTube channel for divorce. Look at that video. Uh, but absolutely, Patisoni, yes, there's hope in righteousness. A person can, if they have sinned, in this area of divorce and remarriage, they can repent of their sin and they can be, as God says it in Isaiah, white as snow before him because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is not some unforgivable sin. Next question comes from Hanny. I'm answering these quick because this is a lightning round. Hi from Indonesia. Why doesn't God speak with human uh, in our time like Jeremiah in the Old Testament? I love the enduring word app. It really helps me to understand the Bible more. Thank you. Hey, Honey, I'm happy to hear it. I'm so happy to hear that you like the app. God bless you, Paul and Diane, you folks out there working on our app and doing such a tremendous job with it. Um, but listen, uh, Honey, because God wants us to trust in an even more reliable word, and that's the word of the written word of God, the Bible. We should not expect God to speak to us in an audible voice today. And even if he did, it would not be as reliable and trustworthy as the tested, proven word of God that will endure forever. So I tell people all the time, man, if you want to hear God speak to you, open your Bible. And I do not exclude the possibility of God communicating to people in other ways. But that is never more reliable than his sure, tested, and approved word. Any the great news is we have something greater than even an audible voice from God. Okay, next question comes from Raquel. Is the Holy Spirit a person in the same way we think of Jesus as a person, similar to how others have stated in dreams that God is also perceived of as a person? Well, Raquel, yes, the Holy Spirit's a person. But what you have to get out of your mind is we normally associate a person with a physical or material body. That's just the way we normally think. In the spiritual realm, somebody can be a person without a material physical body. And the Holy Spirit is just that. He is a genuine person. He has a mind, a will, emotions. Yet, he does not have a material or physical body. So yes, Raquel, the Holy Spirit is a person. Christina asks, I have a question also. Why doesn't Jesus just cast Satan to hell the first time? And why just bind him for a thousand years? Christina, because when Satan is set free at the end of the thousand years, he's able to gather up a rebellion against God from a humanity that has been governed perfectly for a thousand years, showing that the real problem with humanity is not our environment, but the individual human sinner. Now, our environment makes a difference. It can make things worse. It can make things better for sure. But the ultimate problem with humanity is not our environment. It's our own sinful nature. And the fact that Satan is able to gather a rebellion after a thousand years of the perfect government of Jesus Christ on earth shows how, how messed up humanity is. And God shows that before.
before the great white throne judgment, at least according to the book of Revelation. All right, a few more. Lightning round. Uh, Dusanka asks, must one be baptized to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, what if you were only baptized by sprinkling at a Catholic church? Thank you. Blessings. Dusanka says, this is a lightning round. I'm going to give you a very quick answer. If you want to be an obedient follower of Jesus Christ, you need to be baptized. And you need to be baptized as a believer, not as a child, not as a baby, uh, not a as a child who had no ability whatsoever to express faith. But you need to be baptized as a believer, and you need to do that to be an obedient follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus told his followers to be baptized. Dusanka, you want to be obedient to the Lord? I know you do. So find a way. Um, find a godly pastor or church and have them baptize you. Raquel asks, what is your opinion according to the location of the Ark of the Covenant? Raquel, I believe it is unknown if it is on earth at all. It's possible that it's destroyed altogether, but its location is unknown. Uh, and finally, Lynn asks, can you help me to understand the judgment believers will endure? Lynn, the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ where believers will be judged not for their eternal salvation, but for how they have served and obeyed and honored God in this life. And it'll be a judgment not for salvation, but for reward, uh, how that particular believer will be rewarded before the Lord. Uh, Lynn, that's the basic thing. Uh, but you could look up my commentary where it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. You can just do a Google search for that phrase. Look up the commentary on EnduringWord.com for those passages. It's in 2 Corinthians, I believe. And that'll give you a little more information on it. All right, folks. That's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. I will be with you next week, uh, God willing, and if we live. And I do want to say something before we close. I am considering changing our question and answer time to Wednesday at noon instead of Thursday at noon. Of course, if we do that, we'll try to give you a lot of notice, but it's just something running around in my head. Uh, looking at my travel schedule, uh, I can make more of them if we do the Q&A on Wednesday instead of Thursday. So I'm thinking about it, uh, just to let you know. Otherwise, so, so pleased that you could join us today. God bless you, uh, Nils and Gunnel in Sweden. If you're watching, blessings to you. Serena, uh, I can't imagine that you're still watching, but thank you for your question. Thank you to our moderator and the whole team and Enduring Word for all the great work that you do. God bless you, and we'll see you again. Bye-bye.